I'm Caroline Hyde from London. In for Emily Chang, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, big blues for IBM as revenue drops for the 21st straight quarter. We'll break down IBM's losing streak as investors lose patience. Plus, the annual meeting of the minds as leaders in tech converge on Colorado to share ideas on cybersecurity, AI and the future of work. We're live in Aspen at the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference. And Google rebrands its digital eyewear with a new focus on factories. We'll get an update on the upgrades to Google Glass and how the new corporate version resonates with users. But first to our lead, it's a hit and a miss for IBM. While earnings per share beat, shares are dropping after hours after the tech giant came out with revenues that fell short. Sales in the company's technology services and cloud platforms, that's a key new area for the business, well, it declined. 5.1% from the same period a year earlier. It's the 21st consecutive quarter that sales declined year over year. Joining us from New York is Anurag Rana. He's from Bloomberg Intelligence. Anurag, I'm looking at the EM function on Bloomberg. It shows you earnings trains. This is painful when you're digging into revenue because you are just seeing year upon year of negative revenue. You're seeing it was just minus 5% in the second quarter, minus 3%. We can't see growth all the way out until 2018. This is difficult for Virginia, Virginia Rometty. Oh, it's uh, definitely a, a sore point for investors for the past several years. Now, as uh, you know, you know the company has been transforming their businesses to, um, you know, rely more on emerging technologies, whether it's cloud, AI, uh, analytics, security, and you know those portfolio of those products usually do very well for IBM. But it's the legacy products that uh, you know pull down the entire uh, the total sales of the company. How did the so-called strategic imperatives do, for example, because that is where the focus of growth is, the AI, as you said. I mean, we saw, why, why did we see the decline in sales, and particularly in the services and the AI unit? Well, the thing is, um, you know, it, in, in quarter after quarter, in, you know, you could you could see some lumpiness based on if there is a large contract, one you know, one quarter or the other. But you know, the, the general trend is still the same. Uh, cloud business grew up about thirty percent, which is similar to what we saw in the past free, previous quarter. So, you know, overall. The, the message is still the same, that when you come to legacy products, it's still undergoing a massive change where clients are going and saying, you know, you've been working at this with us for quite some time, now we want to change the portfolio of products that we buy from you, but now what's happening is, in, when, you, when you are buying those products or when you are selling those products, you have a lot more competition and whether it's Amazon, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Google, you know, you have a, a new set of competitors in the game. New set of competitors and investors do seem to be getting frustrated by this. I'm looking at a chart on the Bloomberg function. If you type in G hashtag BTV and then put in the number 5121, you can see how much IBM has underperformed the NASDAQ in this year alone. NASDAQ's gained IBM, unlike the rest of the FANGs, for example, has fallen. We saw the likes of Warren Buffett cutting his stake in IBM. Are more and more investors not willing to wait for this turnaround, even though, as you say, Anurag, it is coming? You know, one of the things that we uh, look into is that when you look at the growth story, that's I think I think everybody understands that it's going to take some time for growth to come back. But it's the gross margin story, I think, which is a little more interesting. Uh, you know, last quarter we saw a decline in almost every division. Now this time, I think they have uh, slightly exceeded analyst estimates on gross margins. But the big question is, do we get a rebound in profitability in the second half uh, as some of those investments start to pay off? I think that really is the big message here, and you know, not so much focusing on the top line because you know, as we all know, it's going to take a few quarters for that to, uh, to reverse itself. Where do they stand on forecasts? Because I was reading before, largely from your own great reports, that they need in their second half to have the, one of the highest earning second halves yeah. in, their 20, in the last 20 years for IBM if they're going to make, make the company's forecasts. Have they managed to reassess where they might meet them or not? Well, they have, uh, at least at this point, they have maintained the guidance for the full year on the conference call, which uh, should have started uh, now. You know, they're going to give a little bit more detail as to how they expect margins to improve. You know, in their, for example, in their systems division, they have a new new product cycle that's going to come in the second half. That should help margins. Um, the M&A that they have done last year, that should mature, and that should help margins. And the investments they've been doing in cloud, you know, that would taper off a little bit. So there are several factors that can help 
offset some of the pressures we saw in the first half, but there are still a lot of structural issues in the company, and really, you know, that, that is really the, the, the main point, whether they can overcome that in the second half. Anurag, you mentioned the competition. They're up against Amazon, they're up against Microsoft, who's made big changes in their business to focus on AI. We're, we're seeing the thick and fast. Who's really cleaning up here at the moment? Who's ahead of the game when it comes to the AI, the cyber, the areas that IBM's really trying to push into? See, IBM is targeting more the enterprise uh, AI space, and they have had, a, you could say, an advantage in terms of being the first mover in it. But almost every large company, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Google, whether it's Microsoft, is giving people tools to build those products themselves internally. So, you know, it's, it's the, unlike any other product, these are not standalone products that you can sell and start making money off of it. They will be included and part and parcel of everything that they sell. So as they develop new products, with uh, you know their insurance arm, with, uh, with with banking, you know it's that combination that's going to drive additional sales for uh, for IBM. And for now, investors wait. And in the after hours trading, we're down two percent on IBM stock. Bloomberg's intelligence Anurag Rana, wonderful to get your take. Thank you. Now, another stock we're watching for you, Toshiba. It surged the most in five months after David Einhorn's Greenlight Capital revealed a position in the struggling Japanese company. Now, the hedge fund said that it's wagering Toshiba shares will rise once it exits money-losing contracts tied to Westinghouse business. Greenlight also believes Toshiba can resolve a legal dispute over a sale of its memory business that was meant to shore up its balance sheet. Now coming up, shares of Netflix jumped the most in nearly two years, hitting a new all-time high. We'll dive into that and other tech movers in the market. That's next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, 10 p.m. right here in London. This is Bloomberg. Politics, media and the future of automation were front and center today at the Global Business Travel Association convention that was held in Boston. Our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Eric Schatzker, sat down with Barry Diller, chairman of IAC and Expedia, to discuss how AI has been used to transform his businesses. We've been using machine learning and artificial intelligence for years. I mean, it has accelerated because the computing ability, the, the, the ability to compute faster and faster is accelerated. But artificial intelligence, it's, you know, it, it sounds like, oh my God, and it sounds scary, and it sounds promising, and all of that. But when computers have the ability, which they don't yet have, they can distinguish pictures. Mm -hmm. They can't really do it yet with understanding language. They're really close. And that really is going to be the big, that's going to be the big, big motivating change. That was Barry Diller on stage with our own Bloomberg, Eric Schatzka. Now, let's turn to the markets where the Nasdaq has recovered from the recent tech pullback to close at a new all-time high. But as we head into earnings season, the current value of big cap tech stocks, well, they're once again being called into question. Let's go now to Bloomberg News stocks reporter Abigail Doolittle in New York. You've got it all for us, Abigail. And first of all, talk us through these Nasdaq moves. What were the biggest climbs? What helped set it to the new record? Well, it was a pretty remarkable session, Caroline, in the fact that the Nasdaq actually opened lower, but then by mid-morning managed to trade higher and then finishing at this record close, the first time we've seen that since June 8th, an all-time high, the first time we've seen that since June 9th, erasing that tech pullback, as you, as you mentioned, the mysterious tech pullback. People are still not quite quite sure what was behind that, but just as mysteriously has been erased as it seems investors have more confidence in this high flying sector. So to your point about high flying valuation, valuation is pretty high here. In fact, if we hop into the Bloomberg and take a look at G hashtag uh, BTV, it is 5201. This chart shows what we're looking at relative to valuations, a long term PE of the S&P 500 
tech index and we see back in the bubble of 99 2000 sky high multiple of uh, more than 50 times really very very high and now right above the multi year high at 19 times some investors might say that that's relatively rich the highest it's been since 2009 when stocks were recovering and prices were high and earnings relatively low making for a high pe so the question is are these earnings too high especially for chips the socks or the chip index it's at close to 25 times PE, the likes of uh, AMD, which has been up in a huge way over the last year, it actually cannot be measured on a price to earnings basis, Caroline. That's because the E is not there, but on a price to book basis, 31 times NVIDIA, a 55 times PE. So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not investors continue to believe that the valuation uh, is worth it. But from a performance standpoint, we do at least have proof today from Netflix that they are the, pr the performance is in the pudding, they say to some degree. And Netflix yeah. put up a tremendous end of second quarter, beating subscriber numbers uh, better than by 61%. So with that sort of performance, maybe the sky high valuation uh, really makes sense, Caroline. It'll be interesting Wait, to see whether or not that plays out for some of the other tech companies. I mean, I have to say Netflix's price per earnings, I mean, blows my mind. Currently, is standing at 220 three times. It's I mean, that's quite phenomenal. So clearly so much anticipation baked into that particular stock. Not so much anticipation baked into a few of the perhaps down and out IPOs that we've seen over the course of the past few months. Oh, it's pretty amazing, Caroline, to see the carnage of two in particular, Snap and Blue Apron, both down once again today, well below the IPO prices. Blue Apron uh, down more than 30% from its IPO price. Snap below $15. That IPO price, of course, $17. And Snap had initially been high flying, a lot of enthusiasm uh, for what was supposed to be the hot tech IPO of the year. Blue Apron, of course, being uh, pressured from a lot of uh, different fronts, including the fact that Amazon just recently filed a pay patent for uh, a competing uh, meal delivery prep kit. Um, the answer, though, here, or the question, I should say, is what's next for some of those two IPOs in particular? If we mm -hmm. hop back into the Bloomberg, we have a great chart that shows that this is pretty typical action. This is G hashtag BTV 2669. It's a longer term chart. In white, we have Facebook. If you can believe it, after Facebook went public, those shares were down more than 50%. Now, absolutely sky high but look over to the right in that orange line that is just the absolute nosedive of blue apron in purple that is snap however both Square and Facebook have really managed to recover. Twitter in blue, not so much. So the question is, is Snap and Blue Apron, are those closer to Twitter? Are they something more along the lines of Square? Facebook is sort of in its a league of its own, Caroline, I would have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it just an all eyes on Facebook's earnings as they come out next week? Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Always great to get your insight. Now, a story we're watching. Facebook's WhatsApp's messaging service has been partially blocked in China. Now, it comes after the government began cracking down on virtual private networks, or VPNs, which allow users to route data overseas. Authorities have been ramping up social media censorship in China as it prepares for its 19th Communist Party Congress. And as links between Russian intelligence and President Trump's 2016 campaign continue to be scrutinized, we speak with former NSA Director General Keith Alexander. The advice he's giving to the Commander-in-Chief next. This is Bloomberg. Now, the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference is well underway in Aspen, Colorado. The annual event brings together global leaders in the digital world to discuss the myriad of ways that companies are trying to prepare for the future. We are now going to send it out to Bloomberg's Emily Chang, who is live at the event with more. Emily, take it away. Oh. We're having a few technical difficulties. It happens on a tech show sometimes. But I do know that she's been getting some great sound from some really big 
key focuses. Of course, a big key topic among the attendees there has been the state of cyber security as the scale, the frequency of the major hacking attacks continues to rise around the world. Not to mention, well, the investigation of Russian meddling in the presidential election continuing to dominate the headlines. Now, earlier, Emily Chang spoke with someone with expert knowledge of the subject, retired four-star general and former director of the NSA, Keith Alexander, who is now at the helm of IronNet Cybersecurity. Emily started by asking about the boldness of Russia hackers in the U.S. elections. What it points out is not just that it's blatant, but that we're not prepared to defend. You know, so if you left a bag of money on a park bench and then you're surprised that somebody stole it, um, you know, you'd say, well, secure your money. And where I think that gets us to is secure your network. We shouldn't be pummeled with these. We've got to make these changes in cybersecurity. And it's important to point out that it can't be done by industry itself. It has to be an industry-government partnership. And I think, you know, actually, I think this is an area that the Trump administration has taken on. And I think it's important that government and industry work together for a defensive architecture that can block these kinds of things in the future. So actually, whether they're blatant or not, we shouldn't be faced with them. We shouldn't have people that are losing intellectual property to low profile hackers and things like we're seeing. So what's your impression of whether or not the Trump administration is really taking these threats seriously enough? I think on cybersecurity, I've met twice with the president. Both meetings have been great on cybersecurity. He's asked all the right questions. He's pointed to his administration officials to help and his comment to industry and, and to the government, what do you need from me? Exactly what we'd want him to do. So I think he takes it serious. He understands the threat. He's got Tom Bossert as a lead. He's amazing, and Rob Joyce. And I think what they're doing is trying to put this in the right place. So I am optimistic that the government will move forward. I think we in industry, we need that. You know, there's so much you can do as a cybersecurity company but for sectors in the nation, it takes the government to weigh in. I think we can get there. Think of it as uh, an air defense network over our country. You know, if we had everybody defending each state with their own air defense system or each company with their own air defense system, that wouldn't be a viable defensive infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do in cybersecurity. So we have to change that. So uh, we understand you've been advising the administration. What kind of advice are you giving them? What kind of advice have you given to President Trump? Great advice. It's always been great. Oh, my, uh, just along those lines. It's been, we have to work together. Uh, I think the interesting part is my experience in the financial sector and in the energy sector. They're willing to pay and do what it takes to get them secure to where they can. Uh, great, across the board. CEOs and CISOs have been great to work with. Their cybersecurity team in industry, in the financial sector, energy sector, are weighing in and I think doing great work. Mm -hmm. And so the missing link is when they're being attacked, who do you call? Mm -hmm. You dial 911, there's no answer to stop the attack as it's ongoing. We have incident response, but we don't have a way to block the attack. So now if you jump forward to the election and the elections are being attacked, mm -hmm. who do you call? And the answer is it's always after the fact. Well, you need to have a way of defending it at network speed. And that takes industry and government to work together. So if President Trump is taking this issue seriously, as you say, then why hasn't he publicly acknowledged Russia's hacking of the election? Well, I think that's a more strategic question. And so that gets back to what do you want to do with Russia? Um, and how does the administration work with Russia in the future? Do you poke him in the eye or do you talk to him quietly on the side? And when I think my way through it, the comments that I would do is to say publicly, I'm not going to make this harder than I need to. How do I privately engage Putin and the Russian government to get to the right place? You know, we're in, we don't want to create another Cold War, and we don't want a war. So if that's the outcome we want, we have to have some kind of partnership with Russia. Remember, 40 years in the military, Russia was always the adversary. At the same time, uh, we have to be conscious, so it's like that movie where you're looking up at them, right? But you've got to figure out in the Middle East and in other areas, how do we work with and not against them? 
And so I think every administration, the Obama administration, the Bush administration, and now the Trump administration is trying the same thing. If you remember, the Obama administration went in with a reset button. And so I think we've got to give this administration time to work it out. And that what said, that means is don't poke them in the eye yet. That said, you've got all the U.S. intelligence agencies saying this happened, and it seems like President Trump is at odds with his own intelligence agencies. Well, I think really what he's doing is giving himself the ability to deal. And, you know, it, it comes from, I think, when you're a, a CEO and you want to have a strategic deal, you let your people do certain sets of things and you leave yourself enough room to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know specifically on these. I haven't asked on the Russia stuff, so I'm giving you my best mm -hmm. thoughts. But my experience in dealing with him on the cybersecurity is he's very thoughtful. I thought he was well read. He knew all the facts. It wasn't like he was coming up to speed and didn't know it. He had read everything, um, as you would see a CEO doing. And I expect on Russia he's doing the same thing. And the question for our country, I think that we've got to ask strategically is where do we want to be with Russia and China? That was former director of the NSA and CEO of IronNet Cybersecurity, Keith Alexander. And I'm pleased to say Emily Chang joins us now from Colorado. Emily, great interview, and you've had plenty others. Who else have you spoken with? Thanks so much, Caroline. Yes, it's been a fascinating day here at Fortune Brainstorm. Coming up in the show, we're going to be speaking with Marnie Levine, the COO of Instagram. Talk to her about Snapchat and the allegations that Instagram is copying Snapchat. We also spoke with Glenn Fogel, the CEO of Priceline. You'll be hearing that, as well as Penny Pritzker, the former Commerce Secretary for the United States of America. She's now investing. We'll get her thoughts on the administration and what she's doing now. Caroline? Amazing lineup, Emily. Enjoy it out there. Thank you so much. A stellar set of interviews. Now, coming up, we're talking Google Glass. Are you ready for the comeback? This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. In the UK, Prime Minister Theresa May is being encouraged to fire disloyal ministers. That's after leaks of disparaging media stories about various members of the government as ministers hoping to replace her jostle for position. May has warned conservative lawmakers that toppling her could end in an election victory for Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn. Russia has issued a warning to the U.S. It might expel diplomats or shut down property in Russia if its diplomatic compounds in the U.S. are not reopened. In response to reports of Russian meddling in the election, the Obama administration expelled 35 Russian officials and shut down two Russian estates. The U.S. has imposed sanctions on 16 people and organizations linked to Iran. The move comes one day after the Trump administration certified Iran is complying with the nuclear deal. These sanctions are for non-nuclear activity, including support for Iran's Revolutionary Guard. The U.S. is said to be preparing sanctions against some Venezuelan VIPs. They come after President Nicolas Maduro promised to continue plans to establish a new Congress to rewrite the Constitution. That despite a warning from President Trump. More than 7 million people participated in an unofficial referendum to oppose that legislation. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Tuesday here in Washington, already 7.30 Wednesday morning in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, new records for the NASDAQ composite and a one-point gain was enough to do it for the S&P here in the U.S. Yeah, impressive closes there in the U.S., but uh, unlikely to translate to similar gains in the Asia-Pacific. We already see Nikkei futures looking mixed, and they're off a little in Chicago. Uh, the Aussie dollars, meanwhile, pushing ever higher, above 79 cents now. Uh, this is after the Reserve Bank of Australia released minutes on Tuesday. The RBA not ready to tighten yet, but enough in the minutes there to uh, make traders bullish on the Aussie. Uh, also, we see the U.S. dollar weakening. ASX futures also pointing lower despite those record highs on Wall 
Wall Street. We're off about one tenth, one tenth of one percent, and we're waiting on BHP quarterly production numbers. Uh, BHP expected to come in with 60 and a half million tons of iron ore. Elsewhere, looking out for earnings from Hutchison Ports in Singapore, South Korean PPI for June, and Malaysian CPI for June expected to hold steady. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in for Emily Chang. Now, Google Glass is making a comeback, and this time it's eyeing a different type of consumer. After noting its popularity in factories and other large businesses, well, the tech giant changed its focus for the smart glasses, which are now officially named the Google Glass Enterprise Edition. The product is now available in a network of Google partners such as Boeing, GE and DHL. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Technologies Mark Bergen who covers Google's parent company Alphabet. Mark, fascinating and it's all about the enterprise. This shift is big. Right, I mean, it's pretty consistent with, with the direction that Google's been going. Uh, they've been sort of divesting from a lot of these moonshots, the expensive projects, and been going to kind of partnerships or they'll take a stake in a company. And they're also their cloud uh, computing enterprise under Diane Green has become a huge focus for the company. So from what I can understand, uh, Google Glass will effectively, uh, it's still part of X, their research lab, but a lot of the sales strategy is going to go through the cloud team. And this has actually been going on quietly for a couple of years. They've actually been being used within businesses already. Right. I mean, this is the first time. The news here is that Google is finally coming out and talking about it. Uh, you know, they've, they've been having manufacturing, logistics, um, healthcare. There's this network of companies that have been using Google Glass. You know, sometimes they're kind of wavering, and it was never really clear that, that, that Google might just pull the plug on the program. Uh, this is kind of a vote of confidence for those companies now that Google is committed, at least coming out and publicly talking about it. And so uh, is it over for the consumer dream? I mean, they're not going to go chasing Snapchat's own glasses. It's, it's done when it comes to you and I. Or is it all about the enterprise? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, Google, Sundar Pichai is the CEO of Google and, and their VR division. Uh, they're thinking a lot about augmented reality, right? That's still the kind of the dream where you can uh, you know, overplay the real world with the digital world. And, and I think they're thinking, um, they're try and Glass taught them to be a lot more careful about it. Uh, and you can see now that Google will probably be a much more conservative than, than they were in the past. But certainly their competitors here, Apple, Facebook, uh, Snap, Microsoft, they're all pushing very uh, forward pretty fast with AR. So I, I doubt that Google's going to give up on this. Talk to us about another great scoop you've had, Mark. I'm so pleased we got you on this because we're also seeing Google perhaps backtracking a little bit in Google Fiber. What's the story there? Because there's another big shakeup in terms of who's in charge. Yeah, it's been really confusing. I mean, there, there are people in the industry and even inside Google are not entirely clear. This was at one point this, this big challenge to uh, the broadband and cable companies that are often monopolies or duopolies in different markets. And Google came in with incredibly fast service, um, cheaper prices. And from what I could tell in the, the markets they were in, uh, like Kansas City and Austin, uh, the consumers were pretty happy with it. Uh, they had this big plan to go to like over 20 cities. Um, that fell back. Their CEO left in October. The guy who was in charge of the, this big expansion plan. His replacement came in February. He had a, a background in telecom. He was a board member of CenturyLink. Uh, and within five months, he departs. And they don't have a replacement. Uh, and they haven't really given a reason for, for why he departed so quickly. And I think from what I could tell, he was still sorting, sort of sorting out exactly what the strategy is. They, they bought a company that does wireless. And they're talking about sort of using different and new spectrum and waves and kind of exploring the, the new technical capabilities of delivering the internet. And so has it been scale, it, it, it has been scaled back significantly. Are we expecting it to remain smaller? Uh, it's really unclear. You know, from the best I can gather, the, the executives at Alphabet still really care about this project. They still really want faster internet. Um, I think that, you know, one could say that the goal of Google Fiber was to improve internet speeds and reduce prices. Uh, and, and in many ways, they spent a lot of money on that, but they did do that, right? And, and faster internet, cheaper internet is good for Alphabet, it's good for Google. Um, I do think that they're thinking of different ways that they can actually scale this uh, with a sort of, sort of tech technology, a breakthrough in technology, not just a business model, because you know, a lot of the work here is just digging mm -hmm. up trenches. Uh, and that's not something that, that Google historically has, has liked. Well, it's a great story. I urge our viewers to go and check it out on Bloomberg.com. Thank you as ever, Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Bergen. Brilliant to have your time.
Now, let's return to our coverage of the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference in Aspen. We sat down with Instagram Chief Operating Officer, that's Marnie Levine, and our Emily Chang discussed how the platform is working with advertisers to reach, get this, 700 million users. One in five mobile minutes is spent on both Facebook and Instagram combined. Mm -hmm. um, there are two billion people using Facebook and there are 700 million, as you said, using Instagram. So businesses really need to be on both. But what's interesting about the Instagram community is this, and that is that people in the community really want to hear from businesses. About half of our community, so 80% of our community, mm -hmm. nearly half of our community connects with the business voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So they want to hear from businesses. So what we've been really focused on is helping businesses big and small um, advertise on uh, Instagram, advertise in feed and now in Instagram stories. We just started in, uh, advertising there and helping businesses develop their presence and connect with new customers, but also connect more deeply with um, existing customers and we're seeing that businesses are finding great success on Instagram. So how would you rate the success of Instagram stories so far? I think it's been great. You know, if you think back a year ago at this time, Instagram stories did not exist and now there are 250 million people using it every day. So they are not just sharing their highlights, but they're also sharing all of their moments and telling their full story. That can come from businesses too. In fact, of the most watched stories on Instagram stories, a third come from businesses. And so what that shows is that people want to hear from businesses in feed, but also in Instagram stories. Now, Instagram may be the one Facebook platform where e-commerce actually works. And I know you guys are doing some experimentation there. You've got partnerships with J. Crew and Coach and Club Monaco. How, have, how is the progress there so far? It's been interesting. We just, we've started out and had some pilots. People come to Instagram, as I said, because they want to connect with businesses. They want to connect with their friends and family. Sometimes when people are coming, they want inspiration. Sometimes they want to be able to act. They see a great pair of shoes and they want to be able to buy those shoes. But when it comes to shopping, there's a journey in between. And I think that Instagram can play a great role in terms of helping to develop this. That was Marley Levine, COO of Instagram, speaking with our Emily Chang. Now to the latest on the race to autonomous cars. Chinese search giant Baidu has announced an expanded partnership with Microsoft's Azure Cloud Computing Services. It's a move that me is meant to advance autonomous driving adoption worldwide. Now Microsoft will provide global scale for Baidu's Apollo platform, an open source operating system for self-driving cars. The partnership is one of more than 50 that Baidu has launched in an effort to bolster its presence outside of China. Now coming up, we get the latest from travel giant Priceline, how it plans to fend off the competition and maintain the company's growth. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now we continue our coverage of the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference in Aspen, Colorado, where some of the biggest names in tech are gathering. In attendance was Priceline CEO, that's Glenn Frogel, who took the reins of the internet travel giant in January. Since then, well, the company's shares have risen over 34%, cementing its standing as one of the world's largest travel platforms. Bloomberg's Emily Chang caught up with Frogel for an exclusive interview. Now she started by asking about the company's strategy to keep Priceline in the lead. Well, I think we're going to keep doing what we've done in the past. The strategy doesn't change, which is providing a great service for two sides of the market. That's the traveler and the supplier, be it a hotel, be it a car rental, open table, we have restaurants. The idea always is use our technological skills, use what we are able to better than the supplier, is use technology to provide a better service for those customers. The EU just slapped Google with a massive fine based on favoring their own products and search results. Does the EU need to take a closer look at how Google handles travel? Well, I think one thing that um, I've read a little bit in the news about that, but it doesn't say exactly what Google will have to change in their practices. So until we see what that change is, I, I, you know, we can't really comment on that. 
Look, Google's been a great partner for us, and uh, we've uh, done a lot of good work with them in the past, and we hope to continue to have a great uh, combination in the future. Is there an opportunity for Priceline or Expedia to benefit here, though? Because the market certainly thinks so. You know, again, because we don't know what those changes in the way Google operates, how they're going to be. The fact is that when Google's had to make changes in the past or when they wanted to on their own, those have been advantageous to us because we've been able to adopt quickly. Uh, technology people that we have are able to take advantage of these changes. It's a little bit of keeping up as things change, being on a wingman to the pilot up in front, turn quickly and be able to get those new things out very rapidly. That's one of the benefits of scale is we can afford all these people to be able to do there to work on this. If you're a small player, you don't have that many people, you don't have the luxury having those people around to do that kind of thing and make sure it's an advantage for you. Meantime, the hotel industry is mounting a campaign claiming that Priceline and Expedia are monopolistic. What's your response to that? Well, first of all, let's be careful here. That's their lobbying group saying that, and I've read some very nice things from some of the CEOs, some of the companies saying, yeah, I'm not really sure exactly where that came from or what that was. That's one. Two, I'd like to make the point that we, right now, we only book a single digit percentage of the total number of hotel rooms and properties, home apartments that are on our system. Single digit percentage of that total inventory. That's a very small number. Uh, I think that says that I have to disagree with people who are saying that we have some sort of large market share. I think they should look at the statistics. Airbnb is now looking to expand into travel booking. How worried are you about Airbnb as a competitor? Well, I'm concerned about all my competitors. I want to make sure that we're always on the cutting edge of coming up with new things and making sure that we can do things a better way. And look, we came from behind when we started out. We were small. And in Europe, our biggest customer, uh, biggest uh, subsidiary, Booking.com, nobody had ever heard of it. So we're used to coming out undercutting bigger people. So I am aware of people much smaller than us who are coming up quickly and looking, watching, what, what are they doing? That's why we're spending so much time, energy, and money on building out our own home, apartments, and villa product. We're really building that out. We have over 700,000 properties like that on our system. Mm. Now, it's not as aware, people aren't as aware in America about this, but we're going to actively make that happen because I believe that being able to see both that type of home, apartment, villa, and hotels in the same search Look, I'm going off to uh, Iceland with my family uh, next month. And when I looked, I wasn't sure what I want. I got four people to deal with. Do we want an apartment or do we want a hotel? On the Booking.com site, I saw it all right there, and it was all instantly bookable. You know, a lot of these other people who do this kind of home, villa, apartment stuff, it's not instantly bookable. 100% of our stuff is instantly bookable. So when I press, I'm done, I'm done. Unlike, okay, now when message goes off, maybe they'll come back in 48 hours, come back 48 hours, ah, I can't rent it to you. That's annoying. That's friction. Our goal is to get rid of that friction. So when you say you're going to actively make that happen, actively make that more visible, We're doing what does it that right mean? Now. What does it mean? Right now, we have people out there getting more inventory. 700,000, pro over 700,000 properties, we want to have a lot more. We want them everywhere, every type. What does that mean? It means making sure in some type of marketing, I'm not going to say what it is or how it is, but I want people like you. When you think, I need a mm, condo to do some skiing, maybe an Aspen, or maybe I need a place on the beach, when you think, I want anything, booking.com. That's what I want. All right. You still own part of the Chinese online travel giant, Sea Trip. They've made it clear they want to expand internationally. Does that mean more competition for you? We believe that our partnership with Sea Trip is very beneficial to both of us. And I've had a great relationship with the senior management there for over 12 years. It's a dozen years, and I've been talking and working with them and everything. And our investment didn't come until I would gotten to know them for a very long time. And we think that there's a lot of room for everybody in this marketplace. And I think anybody, and you were in China for some time, so you have a pretty good understanding of the Chinese market. You know, there are a lot of people who are they're cooperative and they're competitive. And so I have no problem with this at all, and I think we'll hopefully keep our relationship going for a very long time. So you plan to hold on to the stake, increase it? Uh, one thing I Sounds like you're not planning to sell it. Well, the one thing I'm very careful to say is I never try to make predictions about what we're going to do in the future. That's not very healthy. But I will say we're very happy with our relationship. Another great interview. That was Priceline CEO Glenn Fogel there. Now coming up, our exclusive interview with the billionaire businesswoman and former U.S. Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker on the White House's approach to trade and the future of work. This is Bloomberg.
Now, let's return to our coverage of the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference in Aspen. Emily Chang sat down with Penny Pritzker, that's U.S. Commerce Secretary under the Obama administration. She spoke about the Trump administration's approach to trade and the future of the workforce. First of all, we took transition very seriously and tried to give our successors the benefit of what we had learned over our tenure. And uh, I think what's challenging is, as it relates, for example, to the issue that we're working on here at the Fortune Conference of the Future of Work, is that, you know, I think the future of work requires a focus by not only the private sector but also government to uh, work on workforce training and dealing with the skills mismatch in the short run, but also to deal in the long run with making sure that we're training people for the uh, uh, jobs of the 21st century. But the second role of government is really one uh, in, if you were thinking about a comprehensive plan, economic plan for the United States, a comprehensive competitiveness mm -hmm. plan, uh, is also opportunity. So trade, for example. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I is challenging is to watch us walk away from multilateral trade agreements and to narrow our focus to either bilateral or uh, smaller trade agreements. Do you think I, we're at risk of a trade war? Well, I, th I, I, I wouldn't bet on a trade war as much as I think that the narrowing of our focus in agitating our trading partners is not useful to creating opportunity for Americans mm -hmm. and for American business. And so I worry about that. I, I think that we're, uh, uh, you know, I want us to make progress. That's important for the United States, um, for us to have good and functional open, uh, free and fair trade uh, agreements, but we need to get those in place because the more that we just sort of talk about it and not take action, the more opportunity we're creating for our competitors. So if trade is one, what are your other big concerns about well, the Trump administration? I think, well, it's not so much the Trump administration. If you think about how do we have a competitive America, we need to deal with trade. We also need to have tax reform mm -hmm. so that our companies can be competitive. We need to be investing more in infrastructure mm -hmm. than we are, both digital infrastructure as well as mm -hmm. physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Frankly, comprehensive econo uh, immigration reform is both a uh, moral responsibility, but it's an economic opportunity that I think we're letting languish right now. Um, so I think we, you know, creating greater opportunity is, an, is uh, one part of a uh, comprehensive economic strategy for the country. The other is a social safety net. Mm -hmm. We need to have a social safety net that uh, acknowledges what 21st century work is like. And we've got 55 million Americans out of 140 million working Americans who are in the gig economy or the on-demand mm -hmm. economy. We've got to make sure the social safety net is supported supporting mm -hmm. all Americans. Mm -hmm. So whether it's health care, we can't just repeal health care and uninsure 20 million Americans. We've got to make sure Americans have access to um, health care, that, uh, that they have access to workforce training that will allow them to be successful. In the conference, in the Fortune Conference today, we were talking about the fact what Americans want is to know they have stable earning capacity mm -hmm. and they want security in that and so social safety nets a part of that opportunity is a part of that workforce training is a part of that that was emily chang speaking with former u.s commerce secretary penny pritzker there now here are some tech stories out of europe grabbing our attention ericsson came up short in the second quarter profit and revenue at the swedish wireless equipment maker missed estimates ericsson is warning that its turnaround plan will take time and require steeper cost cuts as a result well shares of the company took their biggest dive this year falling more than 15 percent Meanwhile, Oracle is ramping up its cloud computing services in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. The California company is hiring 1,000 employees in the region. Last month, Oracle said that cloud revenue rose 58% from a year ago and now accounts for 12% of its overall sales. 
And Lloyds of London has issued a new report outlining how costly a cyber attack can be. The insurance market says a global cyber attack could result in damages of as much as $121 billion in an extreme event, comparable to economic losses of a natural disaster like a hurricane. Recent attacks such as WannaCry in May and Petya in June have raised awareness of increased vulnerabilities in companies. According to Lloyd's estimates, the global cyber insurance market is currently worth between three and three and a half billion dollars. Now, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We'll have more coverage from Aspen on Wednesday and bring you our conversations with blockchain CEO Peter Smith and Mike Hopkins, Hulu CEO. That's all for now from London. This is Bloomberg.